Welcome to Crimson Guitars, welcome to my home studio and welcome to, welcome to something different. I've got a hankering to learn more about guitars. I've been building them for rather a long time. It must be 20 years or, or thereabouts. I read magazines, I read books and I watched music videos and I was enthralled by the world of the electric guitar but over the last decade I suppose I've lost myself in what I was doing and I haven't really paid attention to the market. A hell of a lot has changed but also I realized that I was not playing other people's guitars in spite of the fact that I still lusted after many of them. I said, no, I can just make myself. Uh, <laughs> I've been threatening to build myself, for example, a PRS hollow body, uh, the, the sort of the thick one was at the hollow body too, forever from now, on a very regular basis, I'm going to buy a guitar by another manufacturer, take it apart on camera, look at the wiring, measure the, the output of the pickups, check what the neck feels like, how it comes out of the factory if it's relatively new, what the frets are doing, uh, how they built what they did, at what budget they've done that. While I'm learning, while I'm experiencing, while I'm getting to play a lot of guitars that I haven't been able to justify buying, really, uh, I'm also hoping that you guys are going to enjoy, learn potentially, uh, find interesting things about whatever the manufacturer of the day has done that um, could potentially inform what you do and what you are interested in doing moving forward. It's going to be interesting. Burning. Perfect! <laughs> Today I'm working on a Hofner Galaxy, which is a supremely cool looking instrument from the 90s. And uh, this is the sort of thing that I, I would have, you know, given my back teeth for. Once I've experienced them for a time and done all of the research into how they're made, made a video, I'm going to raffle the instrument off. I'm going to raffle most of the instruments off. I'm sure there are going to be one or two that will have to just stick around. And that means that you guys, who may be in the same situation I was in back then, who can't justify spending two, three, four, five thousand pound on a high-end guitar, could potentially, for the cost of a couple of quid's worth of raffle tickets, uh, could potentially end up owning it. The people who've been winning my guitars recently have, I think the most anybody spent on tickets was about 50 pounds and won a whole instrument. And that, that makes me very happy. I've always had a weakness for three pickup guitars. My first love, my first dream was to own a, a Gibson um, Black Beauty with the three pickups. And the gorgeous thing about this is you've got volume tone and instead of a blade switch or a toggle switch, something like that, you've got just individual switch switches turning the pickups on or off. It's a pretty cool and incredibly versatile way of doing it. And there are actually roller saddles on the tunematic style bridge, which... <laughs> I mean, what else do we have? It's just, a, it's just an interesting guitar in relatively good nick. The frets are okay, the fretboard is dry. I love the headstock with this transfer logo. I think that's very cool and very vintage. Those butterfly string tensioning things are not particularly attractive. And this is where we find out that we've got a budget guitar, really. Those are cheap as. The tuners are cheap as. And uh, it's a bolt-on neck as well. Uh, there's some wearing out. I'm gonna have to, I think, oil this. With the pickups all off, I've got some hum that goes away when the tone is off. Interesting. Just out of interest, I'm going to play a single note. Okay, all off. Neck. Middle. So the bridge is noticeably, noticeably brighter, but uh, the, the middle and the neck, there's, there's not all that much going on. But I think potentially that's because there is, uh, the neck is relatively far away. 
You've got the tailpiece where the strings go in the end, which I like, and then your trim arm just sits in there. Now this is the interesting thing. That is absolutely locked off, which is perfect because if you don't use a trim, and I don't use a tremolo, you want to lock it off, don't you? This screw here, unlocks it. And also changes the tension. So it sounds good, it feels good, but it can sound better, it can feel better. Off with the amp. Now this guitar was in the store for some time. Uh, the strings are not dead, but also, you know, uh, we are going to replace them. As a matter of course, well, there we go, that just broke by loosening it. What can you do? The tuner itself is closed up. They've got these little press fit tabs. That's quite loose in there. And you've got a little hole through which you can grease it up. No rust, a little bit of dust, no, no problems, no issues really. I'm gonna take the neck out of the guitar at this point. What we've got is the holes through the body are so close to the size of the screws that they've actually, the screws have threaded into the wood. Oh. Yuck. The next actually... <laughs> no, it's not. Oh, hello. <laughs> We've got a shim. Yeah, it's not particularly nicely done. I was gonna say, oh, this neck is sticking in nicely, but it, it wasn't. It was the finish. It had stuck to itself. So it's stuck on the side, stuck on the back. It's not a bad looking chunk of maple, perfectly slab sawn. So the maple is, it's in its least strong configuration, shall we say. So as it stands, we've got a bound fretboard. It is uh, a rosewood of some sort uh, or a rosewood uh, analogous type of timber. Uh, the frets, I think these frets have probably been re redone at some point. Uh, so I'm going to move the body off and we're going to concentrate on the neck for now. Notched straight edges. We are in the process of uh, adding bevels to the notched straight edges. Because you've got such a big surface, you can't actually see everything that's going on underneath it. Um, premium straight edges always have a bevel and we want to be premium. That's actually fairly straight. I'm going to need a, a slight adjustment on there. Okay, so the truss rod's actually very... Yeah, it's got a very nice positive, positive action to it. So there's a few areas where you can just see a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of light coming through. So I've got the neck absolutely, absolutely flat. We're going to clean this up and give it a coat of guitar finishing oil uh, at some point. But uh, let's get the frets and fretwork done first. I do love the mother of toilet seat inlays. Okay, so we've got a plastic nut here. And I think they are actually the original frets. There, it looks like there's some tear out just in the corner of the fret. But actually there's tear out all the way along the fretboard where it hasn't been fully sanded. So yeah, that looks like tear out that you would get from, from ripping the frets out. Uh, but you've actually got a lot of tear out around. So it looks like they've just not done a particularly good job of sanding the fretboard down. And again, this was a, a relatively budget instrument uh, when it was made. 
which doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad instrument. That's the, uh, that's the interesting thing. Prior to do anything with the frets, I need to see what needs to be done to them. Fret rocker, gently. Move it along, I'm sort of trying to rock it. There we go. 0 0.07 uh, millimeters or 0 0.028 inch. So one of those frets is high or one is low. So, so the third fret is, is, is very high at this point. I suspect that this guitar has never had a level crown and polish. And there. And there. And there. And there. And there. And there. <laughs> and there. Crikey. You shouldn't see that amount of rock. That is substantial. Okay. So these fret ends, you can also see the fret ends are very sharp. It's not horrendously uncomfortable, but we can definitely do better. I'm not going to mask the fretboard off, not until I get to the final polishing stage. Uh, I'm going to level them first. So, let's crack on with that. I'm being very gentle. Look, my neck is loose on the workbench. I'm just holding it just, just with the tip of my finger. I'm not putting a lot of pressure on. I'm not pushing down a lot. The weight of the leveling beam is doing its job. When you're working with an unknown guitar, you might end up with a fret that isn't actually properly seated. It's not glued in, and these certainly weren't glued in, uh, but the slot might be a little bit loose, and, and a particular fret, as you're going over it, might be pushing down with the leveling beam, and then just popping straight back up after you've gone through, and that would then give you the, the rock that we've, uh, <laughs> that we've seen earlier. When you go over with the leveling beam, you should be able to actually hear the difference between most of the frets that are well seated and the one that is loose. And it's sort of a whispering kind of a noise. So I'm doing it evenly over the whole fretboard. So that's a low spot and that's a low spot where around it, everything else is working. So when you put the, uh, uh, the premium quality fret rocker on, it's rocking into that hole. And that is still feeling high. So I'm gonna take the end of the uh, Fred Rocker, and just see if I can see any movement. Oh, I can. There's some bounce in that fret. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see it. Every time I pass over it, it's uh, it's pushing itself down, and then after I relieve the pressure of the leveling beam, it is popping back up again, and I'm still gonna have a high spot. So it looks like it's been leveled. I've taken off all of the material and, and all of the, uh, the permanent marker, etc. but it's still got a rock, and that is why a fret rocker is an essential tool. I'm not sure if I'm gonna finish this today. It might be a two-day job. So I don't want the super glue to wick over the edge of the fretboard. So I'm just gently going in on either side. Like so.
So the way this works is running the chisel flat on the board means that anything that isn't flat on the board will get cut away. Running alongside the fret there, and that is actually, that's left me with a very clean fretboard even after using super glue. That's a much cleaner effort than using, using a scraper and scraping like that, at least initially. Scrapers like a relatively flat surface to start with, where they just accentuate bumps and things. rectangular scraper you can go in if it's sharp and scrape everything down if that's required problem is that leaves stops and starts scratches and it leaves a, a fretboard that doesn't look very nice now even here where you've still got evidence of the super glue I do need to scrape a little bit away. That wasn't just evidence, it was actual super glue. And then now, this is a, a fine thread rubber. I could go back to medium, in fact, probably should go back to medium. But that there polishes up the fretboard and gives a really good finish. Ooh, that works nicely. I'm fairly sure I've got most of the uh, most of the super glue off. I'm just going to hit it with a quick scrape. I'm going to just quickly start with a medium fret rubber and uh, while I'm polishing the size of the frets with the rubber, I will do the fretboard as well. They look to be seated properly because the super glue has filled the small gaps and it looks like a much better fretboard uh, than it did beforehand. This one here, that one there, that one. That whole area there, I'm hardly touching it, if I'm touching it at all. I'm having to take off a lot of material in order to get these frets level. A lot of material. On to the leveling file. I'd forgotten how much I enjoy using this, this tool. I've been using beams for a while now, almost exclusively. I think these are the, this is the worst fret job I've ever seen. So there we go. Plastic, hollow plastic nut. That was not a typical fret level. This is about learning and, and there's always, no matter how much fret work you do, there's always gonna be something interesting that happens. For the longest time, I have said that concave fret crowning files are not good tools to use. That being said, I haven't actually tried one in a long time. As it stands, I'm going to do something I'm not comfortable with and try this tool. I like the fact that I'm not 
having to use a fret board protector. I do think that the half round crowning file is just terrible. It was a good experiment though. Now I'm doing this without using a fretboard protector, just wondering, uh, again in the interest of experimentation, how much cleanup will be needed. Fret and dressing file. We've got a flat safe edge and we've got a slightly rounded safe edge and it's a very fine little file. So round, round the fret ends over. I'm getting everything done to the same level and then I'll go through and tidy up any inconsistencies that I see. Don't forget that this guitar could be yours. It's a link to the raffle in the description. So essentially at the moment, I'm just, just tidying up the curves so that we don't have any sharp tabs left over. Uh, 240 grit paper wrapped around my finger. Yeah. I didn't use a fretboard protector when I was doing the crowning. So I'm gonna have to redo a little bit of cleaning up on the fretboard that I did beforehand. This is really easy, actually. I don't particularly like the color of this fretboard. I think I want to do something about that. Okay, 600 grit paper wrapped around a fret rubber. Doing the fret ends. This is rounding things over. It's making a pleasing rhythmic noise. I should have been a percussionist. So we're going for something uniform. And you'll notice that I'm going along the length of the guitar rather than with the frets, which is where the strings will go as you're bending them, etc. At this point, I come in with this tool. So this is a this is a fiberglass pen. They're used uh, for cleaning up electrical contacts and all sorts of bits and pieces. And I have been wondering for quite some time now how it would do on a fret. It's pretty freaking perfect. It's a little bit coarse maybe on the uh, on the fretboard there. I do appear to be wearing through the pen quite quite rapidly though, so it might not be perfect. But as an experiment, I'm very happy. I think there is a place for it, and uh, yeah, you guys should experiment with it. But uh, at the moment, it's just doing the job that a a fret rubber would do, and it's wearing away quite, quite rapidly. I suspect that what I need to do is uh, put a fret rubber in a pen. <laughs> uh, I'm going to buff the hell out of these frets. I'm going to do something new and interesting on the fretboard. Oh my gosh, it's perfect. But essentially, I'm going with the grain. It's also not touching the side of the frets. And this is the thing. So I've had this tool in mind for for cleaning and polishing for actually a really long time. Uh, I think I first saw them a couple of years ago 
and had the thought, oh, that could be useful. Fine fret rubber. And I'm also polishing the sides of the frets with the fine fret rubber at this point. That there, my friends, is starting to look like a presentable fret job. I don't particularly like the colour of this rosewood. Just wondering how much darker a little bit of blonde shellac would make it. And you know what? That looks a little bit more like rosewood, doesn't it? Yeah, let's do that. Now I'm going to polish any shellac off the tops of the frets shortly. So I am going to have to, to use the fine or a super fine fret rubber to just, once this shellac is cured, flatten it down a little bit. By end of play today, these frets are going to be absolutely uh, polished and the neck will be ready for uh, for finishing. I tell you, fret rubbers are incredible. In fact, I'm going to rename them fret and fret board polishing rubbers. Let the man to the rescue again. So from this point, I need to start folding the uh, masking tape in because it is wider than the available fret slots. It's a fairly straightforward process. It's just pick it up and ease it into the corners. I'm just going to mask the side off because I really want to make the fret ends as uh, buffed as possible and I don't want to touch the cream binding very much. And you always want to go from the center of the fretboard to the outside. So I have a little bit of uh, buffing combined on the tops of the frets at the moment, but you can see, <laughs> wow, you can see just how shiny those are. So uh, yeah, polishing compounds and bits and pieces there. Yeah, the fretboard finish and restorative generally gets rid of that, but not in this case. Isopropyl alcohol, then touch it. Ooh. So this is a uh, a new tool that we're going to be launching soon at Crimson. It's a fret file handle, but with a uh, a strop, a leather strop attached to it. Same polishing compound I used. <laughs> uh, and of course it's doing the job because, you know, it had to because uh, this was my last, uh, my last thought. You can see where it's polishing the frets and buffing the, buffing the strop. I'm going with the frets. Wow, this is actually making them even shinier than they were off the buffing wheel. Like little black holes of incredible speed and tone frets, everybody, tone frets. We've taken what was the single worst fret job I have ever had on my workbench ever. And if it's not the best set of frets I've ever made, it's damn close. Uh, I'm really, really, really happy with how this has turned out. Let's find 
some fretboard restorative. Yes, I've got a tiny little bit left of this really old bottle. This stuff lasts pretty much forever. Yeah, this is the last job of the day. and it's darkening that fretboard down even more. Now the shellac has sealed the rosewood a little bit. Got the excess off. I might apply a little bit more. But for now, and for today, we're pretty much done. That there, people. That's a fretboard to be proud of. I'm really, really happy with this. Very comfortable. Very comfortable indeed. I will see you soon, or you'll see me before then. Uh, there's like all sorts of things to watch. Mainly on YouTube. Goodbye. Have a great evening, morning, day, week. Go make some sawdust. Goodbye.